thank you, Saul, for saying nice things and not the other things. Uh, I was told I had three hours to speak, so I'm going to have to change slide. Yeah, sorry about that, Tommy. Uh, what I'd like to do is give you a 300-year lesson in neuroscience. I'll call it Neuroscience 101. And, you, and if I'm going to do 300 years in 17 minutes, that either means I know very little or I speak very quickly. I'll let you judge. Um, I'd like to take you uh, back first to 1894. And we're going to, I'm going to give you a little background about the brain, how we have thought the brain works, and then I'll tell you a revolution that's been occurring in the last 20 years that's understanding new aspects of the brain that we really thought were mute. And then with that background, we're going to go on to talk about Alzheimer's disease and potential ways we might treat this in the future. So one of my former trainees is uh, Spanish, and he's at the Cajal Institute in Madrid. And Santiago Ramon Cajal is a famous histologist. And this is a, a hand drawn. I actually went to the museum, I put on the white clothes, we were able to pick up the individual pieces of paper. This is a drawing of the human brain at postmortem. And there are some key things that you can see in this drawing. Um, sort of along the bottom, there are three oval shapes. Those are neurons. Neurons are the electrically active parts of our brain. You have an EEG, you listen to neurons. But right in the center, there's this darker brown cell. This is called a glial cell. Glia means glue. And the original histology looked at these cells and they said, they're just glue. They're holding neurons together. And that is how we thought about the brain until 1990. Now, why do we have this bias? Well, the bias was for a very good re Oh, and I'll take this and put it into the context of Alzheimer's disease. So why did we have this bias? We had the bias because of language. Now, I don't speak Japanese while my wife says I sometimes speak Japanese. That's when I'm falling asleep. Um, I don't speak Japanese, so I can't hold a communication with someone in Japanese. I speak English, so I speak English to people, they speak back. So what do I do? I just focus on English. In the brain, we've got all these questions, but we can only ask questions if we have the technology that allows us to speak and listen. And neurons are electrically active. So very early in the last century, it was discovered that if you stimulate the brain electrically, the brain responds. And if you record the electrical activity, you can listen to the brain. And some key studies were performed by Rhoda Penfield. And this is a picture of a human brain, a living brain. And he would go in and do surgery on epileptic patients. And, was able to, as, and they were conscious. And he could stimulate specific regions of the brain. And it would cause a motor act. So for example, twitch the left arm, stimulate another region, the right arm. He could stimulate yet other parts of the brain. And you would have a sensory perception. So this clearly showed that electrical activity is really important. And don't get me wrong, electricity is key in the brain. Everything I'm doing requires the electrical activity of the neurons. Earlier in the 1700s, uh, Galvani actually described this. And the way that this is a superb experiment. This is a frog. And he just happened to touch the spinal cord and the muscle. And the muscle twitched. And he came up with the idea of animal electricity. So from 1700s through to the 1900s, electricity is very important. So what's happened is we've had the focus in terms of understanding the brain and also in drug discovery on neurons. I will tell you in our brains, 10% of the volume of our brain is comprised of neurons, the electrically active cells of the brain. What's the other 90%? The other 90% is glue. It's not glue. <laughs> And what's happened is, we've discovered in the past 20 to 30 years that these glial cells are targets that we may be able to understand more about how the brain works and also identify new for disorders. So the greenish cell, it's called an oligodendrocyte, and it makes insulation around axons, and that insulation is extremely important for conduction of the action potential. If your oligodendrocytes don't work properly, you end up with multiple sclerosis. The yellowish cell is called an astrocyte. If you stay up late tonight and get very sleepy, the astrocyte is driving you to sleep. Then the bluish cells on the right are called microglia, and these are in, these, I call these the garbage men of the brain. In my kitchen, and I'm sure yours, it's really important that you take the trash out. You bring in food, you take out the trash. If you don't take out the trash, you have a problem. And I'm going to pose to you that one of the big problems in Alzheimer's disease is the garbage collectors don't come. Garbage accumulates, and we then have deleterious effects. So, Glia, in 1992, we had a total chance observation. Everything I've done in science has been luck. We were studying neurons, and we, were, we had this little culture of dishes. 
and we were measuring chemicals being released by neurons. Then we realized we actually killed the neurons. So what was releasing the chemicals? Was it the plastic dish? No. So we looked in the microscope and we saw these other cells and they were glial cells. So we had two choices. We throw the data out and put the neurons back in and start studying the neurons. But we decided we're going to turn 180 degrees. Because when, when chance observations arise, make use of them. So since 1992, we've been studying glia. To try to understand how do they control the brain. And I want to take you through a fun exploration of the last four years, which we've done. I moved to Tufts in 2008, and so the work I'll be talking about now has been in the past four years. So let's first talk about Alzheimer's disease. It does need an introduction. Everyone in this room is some way touched by Alzheimer's disease. I believe that this is the biggest crisis for this country in a long time. On the left is an Alzheimer's brain, and on the right is a normal brain. And the, the problem comes in many ways. First, for the patient. Second, the caregivers. Life expectancy of Alzheimer's caregivers is decreased. Last year, the cost for Alzheimer's in the US, $183 billion. This year, it's projected to be over $210 billion. By 2050, $1.1 trillion. This is unsustainable. So on the one hand, it's a serious problem for us personally. On the other hand, it's a real financial problem. And we have to cure this disease so that people's quality of life can be improved and we can end up um, enjoying those later years in our life rather than having this awful disorder. I want to show you now the way in which we're going to approach this. So in all of our brains at the moment, we are using a, a peptide called amyloid beta. And you've heard of this molecule. And amyloid beta is normally used in signaling in the brain. And so hopefully your amyloid beta is uh, working perfectly. There's a protein called amyloid precursor protein. It's cleaved. This peptide's produced. And then it's cleared away. And so so long as the production and the clearance are in equilibrium, everything is fine. But what happens is we have inflammatory events in the brain which stop amyloid beta being taken away. So it accumulates. And so if you downregulate the garbage collector, what happens in your kitchen it gets pretty messy, and this is what's happening in our brains. And so this downregulation, so let me take you now, we've gone from the 1700s, I want to take you to two weeks ago, the latest discovery. Two independent studies were published that show a human gene, TREM2, is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And TREM2 regulates the ability to clear amyloid beta. It's essentially controlling the garbage collection. And we've been focusing on phagocytosis, the garbage collectors. So a good friend, Joe Alpuri from Mass General, has said if we could find a therapeutic modality that would essentially reactivate the phagocytic pathway and clearance, this would be incredibly beneficial. And this is what we've discovered. So the cells here in green are microglia. They were blue in my earlier slide. They're containing actually a protein from jellyfish, green fluorescent protein. And in red are little beads. Now, microglia are the, um, the garbage men of the brain. And if you see, especially up in the top left, you'll see microglia cells coming along. They're eating these beads. They're clearing. And this is going on. If you have damage inside your brain, your microglia will keep clearing away the garbage. But in Alzheimer's, they stop working. So how can we do this? I can't come to you and say, I've got a hypothesis. Let me test your brain. <laughs> it's not going to work. So we have to use models. And all models of human conditions have limitations, but we have to start somewhere. So we start the studies in mice. And so you can take the human genes that are risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. Remember I said there's a precursor protein, amyloid precursor protein. Certain mutations in that lead to enhanced accumulation of amyloid beta. You can introduce these genes into the mouse genome, and guess what? The mouse starts to accumulate amyloid beta, just as it occurs in the human, and the mouse has memory impairments. So we can now perturb the mouse and ask whether we can lead to improvements in the mouse. If we can do that, we then go on to higher species and then on to humans. So we have to be able to actually watch things in the brain. So we use an advanced technology called two-photon microscopy, which has only been really popular for about the last 10 years. And in green, 
These are amyloid plaques in a living, well, the mouse was living at the time, when we took the image about two, two years ago. If you remember back to your old histology classes, you cut sections of dead brain, you take pictures, or draw pictures. Here, the microscope is able to make an optical section, and it's able to keep looking down and down, and then the computer reconstructs a three-dimensional image. So in red, we've injected a red dye into the vasculature, and this is like a, you know, the, we all remember Round McNally. I know our children don't remember Round McNally maps. <laughs> but this is like a rat, the, the uh, vasculature is like a map of the brain. So as it turns around, you'll see there's a r big red highway going south and north. That could be I-95. <laughs> and then the white one coming across could be I-80. And so you know you can come into these roads and then you'd be able to find Manhattan. Well, in the same way, we can identify the amyloid plaques. We can literally give a plaque a name. And we can come back and image it day after day after day. So this is what we do. We want to test the compounds of ability to clear plaques. So on, this is an, a, a mouse that's got the genes from the human. We inject a dye that makes the amyloid green. Then on day one, we thin the skull and we image into the brain. You just sew the skin up and the animal goes back into Viberia, perfectly healthy. But we can also give a treatment. And then come back at a later time, three days later, two weeks, six months later, and go back to Interstate 80, Interstate 95. Look for Manhattan and ask how are the structures. So can we really do what I'm saying? So this is an eight week old mouse. Two weeks later, we image it again. Two weeks later, we image it yet again. I hope you'll see that the interstates are still in the right locations, and you're seeing the gradual deposition of amyloid beta in the brain. And as this is occurring, the mouse is starting to lose its memory. And this is the time sequence of eight weeks to 24 weeks. So if we can image in this longitudinal manner, we can now inter interpose the treatment and see what the treatment will do. So, in vivo it looked good, then we went back and did the Cajal method of cutting brain sections and we confirmed it. We're scientists, we like to make histograms and put error bars on and do a statistical test. But we have a statistic in the lab we call the J-O test. Just obvious. <laughs> so when we inject the compound we get this reduction in burden within, within a matter of days. We've now gone on, we've worked with uh, medicinal chemists, we have about 100 new chemical entities. We've gone through and done all sorts of things we have to do. We've got very high affinity chemicals, small molecules, that we've now started testing in mice, and they work, which is, which is very exciting. So on the top left here, it says beta amyloid. Um, you can see in the histograms, the just obvious test, it passes the test. But then we have to actually ask, does that animal regain a memory? So how do you determine if a mouse has a memory? If you ask a mouse if it remembers something, go and see a psychiatrist. <laughs> that doesn't work. So we have strategies that we can take. Does anyone, you have a BlackBerry? Okay. And an iPhone. We don't normally give Blackberries and iPhones to, uh, to mice. But mice love novel objects. So what you can do, you can take the BlackBerry equivalent and put two of these objects in a mouse cage. And you let the mouse explore. You've got a phone with no. <laughs> you can let the mouse explore them. But if they remember these objects, and the next day we bring in new technology, so this is something novel, they will explore the novel object because they have a memory of previously exploring this object. It's called a recognition memory. So you can determine how much time they explore the novel object versus the known object. And if they have equal exploration, they have no memory. So this is the type of test we do. I'll sell the, I'll sell the phones later. <laughs> and so on the right-hand side is the memory tasks. And in the histogram labeled WT is wild type. That's a normal mouse. And it has a good memory. The histogram is high. The middle black histogram is an Alzheimer's gene-carrying mouse. Its memory is extremely poor. And after a week of treatment with uh, these compounds, its memory seems to be working. It likes the iPhone. <laughs> so what we have uh, actually done now is Tufts has spun off a company, a small business about it, uh, on, this, uh, on these targets. 
and the company is trying to push this forward to get compounds in demand as soon as possible. And it's really been due to the general support of many people. The National Institutes of Health, and several inst uh, institutes have supported the funding in the lab. Cure Alzheimer's Fund, uh, Cure Epilepsy uh, also supports our work. And very importantly, uh, Annette and Gustav Guissard uh, really helped us get some of this work off the ground. And I have 28 seconds remaining before I have to stop. So I'll stop now. And if you have any questions, I will attempt to answer them. Thank you.